Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jan Heise. I come from the Institutes of the Institute of Reference Materials and Measurements in uh, Geel. It's one of the institutes of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Um, I graduated at the university in Ghent some time ago as a physics engineer, after which I did a PhD at the same university in uh, experimental nuclear physics. I was mostly involved in proton and deuteron scattering experiments, studying nucleon-nucleon interaction. Um, after that, I switched to the neutron cross-section uh, measurement business. Uh, in between, I've been working for five years at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center as a nuclear engineer, working on the MIRA project. So it's a project um, which is developing, or in the framework of which we are, people are developing an accelerator-driven system. So that's at uh, SEK and MOL. And in the meantime, I've been back in, uh, in Yale at IRMM for yeah, five years, I think, um, as a colleague of uh, Peter Schillebeek and, and Carlos Paradella, who will also present something this afternoon. And we're also working closely together with uh, the Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute with our dear colleague, uh, Jung Il Kim. So he will also present something good. OK, I pronounced it right, thanks. So basically, we will be giving uh, a series of uh, lectures and exercises uh, this afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, and Friday afternoon. So you will be seeing the, the four of us uh, a couple of times. Um, Mr. Kim is uh, from, as I said, from Korea. So he works at the Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute in the Nuclear Data Center. Um, the three of us, we work at IRMM. And so, as I said, IRMM is one of the uh, institutes of the GRC. So the GRC has different sites all over Europe. Uh, quite a few of them are not that far from here in, uh, in Ispra, in northern Italy. Uh, but so we are in, in Belgium, in Giel. Now this is the contents of what we uh, would like to present the next coming days. I will not go through the whole schedule, but just to give you an idea, we will start with some principles of uh, time of flight cross-section measurements and then some uh, evaluation of uncertainties and covariances. That's for this afternoon. And then tomorrow afternoon and Friday afternoon, there are some more lectures and uh, exercises foreseen, scheduled. Um, in this slide, there we have tried to give you an overview of some interesting literature which you might uh, consider having a look at if you're interested by the subject. You will get the slide, so it's no use writing it down now, but just to be complete. And we also brought some materials, so you see the, the books here. Some of you have, uh, have taken them already. Uh, if you haven't, feel free, uh, help yourself. So there's a number of um, reprints of articles, uh, some overview reports, uh, quite interesting since we will be doing exercises with AGS uh, tomorrow and Friday. There's also a manual of the AGS code, so if at least you take one thing, I would consider uh, taking that. Now, to start the subject, I will give a, a brief presentation on the principles of uh, neutron time of flight cross-section measurements, well, brief for the next uh, half an hour or three quarters of an hour. And then Carlos will continue about uh, transmission measurements and um, reaction cross-section measurements. When we are talking about uh, neutron cross-section measurements, it's maybe a good idea to remind you of what we um, are talking about when we're speaking about neutron-induced reactions. So when a neutron is uh, interacting with a certain given nucleus. As a first step, uh, a compound nucleus might be formed as a sort of intermediate state. And this compound nucleus, which is in an excited state, can de-excite through a number of channels. So either the neutron that was absorbed by the original nucleus can be emitted again. And then we talk about elastic scattering. The neutron might be captured, and then the nucleus will de-excite by emitting gamma radiation. In that case, we talk about radiative capture or <coughs> N-gamma reactions. If it's a fissile nucleus, it might fission. It might break up in two large chunks and then a number of neutrons. So that's neutron-induced fission. Um, the neutron might be re-emitted, but 
not with its uh, original energy, but with the limited energy, and then accompanied, uh, accompanied by gamma emissions. So in that case, we are talking about inelastic scattering. And then any other number of um, neutron-induced charged particle reactions might occur. So a proton might be emitted, a deuteron, an alpha particle, triton, anything like that. So all these kind of reactions are uh, possible when neutrons are interacting with nuclei. And so we would like to study them and to do some measurements where we can study the probability for these uh, interactions. Now, the probability for such an interaction is given by a cross-section, and a cross-section is just a, a measure for the interaction probability between an incident particle and a target nucleus, so in this case, a neutron and a target nucleus. And here we've given an overview of a number of cross-sections as a function of incident neutron energy. And so what you can directly see is that the interaction cross-section strongly varies as a function of neutron energy. So you see some uh, 1 over V behavior in the low energy region for most nuclei, then a region where some um, sharp peaks in the interaction cross-section occur. So that's what we call the resonance region. And then going to higher neutron energies, we go back to a sort of continuum uh, region. So there's a strong variation as of the neutron cross-section as a function of neutron energy. You also see that the shape and the um, value or the, the, the amplitude of the cross-section uh, also strongly depends on the type of nucleus that you're looking at. So it's very uh, nucleus-dependent and also strongly neutron energy-dependent. Now, if you want to study this neutron uh, induced cross-section as a function of neutron energy. We will be needing dedicated facilities um, that are providing us with neutrons with which we can probe the different energy regions uh, that we are interested in. Now, why do we want to produce this nuclear data and how is it used? Well, we have experimental facilities producing or trying to map this uh, cross-section behavior as a function of neutron energy. The results of these measurements are what we call microscopic data, and together with uh, nuclear theory um, and integral data measurements, all these results are taken together and are used to produce what we call evaluations. So evaluations sort of try to give a, a summary, a consistent summary of all available experimental and theoretical knowledge to produce a library, a data file that is then uh, used by uh, industry, by regulatory bodies, or by research laboratories uh, for doing calculations on uh, the design of new nuclear systems or for doing safety assessments of nuclear systems, things like that. Now, and basically, it's a, it's a circle because quite often people who are working in practice with uh, nuclear installations, they see that in practice, uh, calculations are not always corresponding to what they see in, in experiments or in the operation of nuclear facilities. So this often points to def uh, uh, deficiencies or lack of data or faulty data in the evaluated data files. And so this is often the trigger to start new measurements. And then we are back at, uh, at the beginning. Um, of course, the kind of data that you need for a certain application strongly depends on the neutron energy spectrum of that specific application. So here on the left-hand side, you see a typical uh, neutron spectrum for uh, a fast reactor. So that's what we are talking about when people are um, studying generation four reactors, or a neutron spectrum of a classical thermal uh, reactor. Here on the right-hand side, you see a typical spectrum for an accelerator-driven system where um, that's driven by a proton beam of 600 MeV. So depending on the neutron spectrum of the application, also different energy regions of the nuclear or the neutron-induced reaction cross-section data will be important. Now, how do we study these um, cross-sections as a function of neutron energy? Well, as I said before, depending on the energy region that you want to study, you will need a dedicated or a different facility. Now, to give you an idea of the facilities we have at our institute, we have, uh, on the one hand, Chilina, which is a neutron time of flight facility, and which is producing neutrons. It's a, producing, it's a white neutron source, so it's producing neutrons from uh, thermal energies up to uh, a few MeV. 
and neutron energies there are determined by the time of flight technique, and I will come back to that later on. If we go to higher energies, we are using a, a Van de Graaff accelerator. So it's an accelerator that is uh, using charged particles to produce uh, mono-energetic or quasi-mono-energetic neutrons through charged particle-induced reactions. So let me first tell you a little bit more about that before going into the real-time of flight business. This is an aerial picture of our institute in Giel. And so here you see the, the Van de Graaff building. So the accelerator is uh, uh, positioned in the, in the vertical direction. In the tower you see on the picture. So that's what it uh, looks <coughs> like on the inside. It's a 7 megavolt Van de Graaff accelerator. It's a DC machine or it can also deliver pulse beams with um, in currents up to 50 uh, microamps. There are different beam lines and some uh, rabbit systems for um, doing uh, irradiations or activations. Now, this kind of facility is producing quasi-monoenergetic neutrons by uh, accelerating charged particles in the Van de Graaff accelerator and then letting these charged particles impinge on certain uh, targets. So here we are showing the example of deutrons that are hitting a tritium target. And then through this reaction, both neutrons and alpha particles are produced. By choosing different targets and either protons or deutrons as charged particle, by playing a bit with the energy of the incident particle, and also by playing at, uh, with the angle under which we observe the neutrons, uh, basically you can produce monoenergetic or quasi-monoenergetic neutron beams over a large range of different energies. And so this next slide is trying to give an overview of that. So depending on the incident particle and the uh, target that you're using, you can sort of cover different energy regions between zero and uh, slightly above 20 mega electron volt. Um, these different reactions uh, allow you to cover different neutron energies, but on top of that, you can also play with the kinematics of the reaction. Um, since both the incident particles and the target nuclei that you typically use for these kind of reactions are uh, quite light, kinematics can play a very important role. So the neutron energy for the same reaction with the same incident beam energy might strongly vary depending on the angle under which you are looking. So this uh, is shown here in the figure um, for, I don't know which, doesn't really matter for which reaction in, in, in particular, but if you're looking at zero degrees, you get a, a peak at the full energy, and then if you look at larger angles, you will see that the energy of your neutrons is, uh, is getting smaller. That's what the monoenergetic uh, part of our activities uh, is about. So it's basically you scan point by point different neutron energies in the energy region that you're interested in. When we are talking about Gilina, as I said before, it's a white neutral source. So it's producing a range of neutrons with different energies uh, at the same time. And let me go a bit more into detail in this. So here you see the same aerial picture of uh, our institute of IRMM with the Gelina facility uh, shown here. Now Gelina stands for Gale Electron Linear Accelerator. It's uh, a pulsed white neutron source, so with neutrons producing neutrons between 10 milli electron volt and 20 mega electron volt. And it's producing all these neutrons at the same time. So how can you then do a measurement as a function of neutron energy? Well, you determine the energy of the neutron that is causing the interaction at the moment of interaction. And that's done by the time of flight technique. So that's how we determine the, the neutron energy. So the facility basically consists of a, a linear electron uh, accelerator, which is producing uh, electrons up to 140 mega electron volt. These electrons are hitting a target, and in this target, neutrons are produced. And these neutrons we use to do our cross-section measurements. As you see from the picture, you, know, you see different uh, flight paths along which the neutrons uh, fly. Along these flight paths, you have different cabins where we have uh, setups to do total cross-section measurements or partial cross-section measurements. And so since we have different beam lines, uh, which can be used simultaneously, Jelina is a, typically a multi-user facility. 
with uh, beam lines ranging with uh, with a length ranging from uh, 10 meters up to 400 meters. So 400 meters would be somewhere up here. Now, how are the neutrons in Gelina produced? Uh, what you see here is the exit of the or the final part, the last part of the uh, beam line coming from the electron accelerator. So this is the, the exit window. Um, the electrons, when they exit, they have an energy up to 140 MeV and they hit uh, uranium targets. It's a rotating target. Uh, it's rotating because if you would be hitting the, the electron beam uh, continuously at the, the same part of the target, it would just heat up and, and melt. So that's why it's rotating. It's also cooled by uh, mercury. And so the electrons are hitting the targets. They are stopped and in the stopping process uh, due to the interaction of the electrons with, with the material. Uh, a lot of bremsstrahlung is produced. And it's actually the bremsstrahlung which is producing the neutrons by gamma N uh, reactions, so photo, uh, photo, no, gamma N reactions and gamma F photo fission reactions in the uranium target. Uh, so neutrons are flying in all kinds of directions. They typically have... Um, an energy distribution which looks a little bit like uh, a neutron, uh, a fission neutron spectrum with a high energy tail, of course, because uh, the electrons have an energy up to 140 MeV. If you want to go down to lower energies, to thermal energies, we have to slow down the neutrons. We have to moderate them. And this moderation process is done by two moderators, which you can see here on top and below the uranium disk. These are beryllium containers filled with water, so basically light material, and by a number of collisions of the, the, between the neutrons and, and the hydrogen molecules and the rest of the material, but mainly the hydrogen in the moderators, the neutrons will slow down, and so you will soften your uh, neutron spectrum. So that's what you see here. Here on uh, this plot on the right-hand side, you see the flux as a function of neutron energy, so the red curves shows uh, the fast spectrum, the spectrum that of the neutrons that are produced in the uranium targets. And the blue spectrum is a spectrum that you get after moderating the spectrum uh, with the containers on top and below of the spectrum. Now, uh, people often ask, uh, well, can you switch between the two? Yes, we could, but actually we do the two things together at the same time. And we just switch between uh, a moderated spectrum or a fast spectrum by putting shielding between the neutron producing targets and the entrance of the different flight paths. So if at a certain flight path we uh, want to do measurements with fast neutrons, well, we will make sure that we shield neutrons coming from the moderators because neutrons coming from the moderators will have a, a thermalized or a slowed down moderated spectrum. And we will only be looking at neutrons coming directly from the uranium target. So they are still having this, this fast spectrum shape. And inversely, we can also shield the neutrons coming from the uranium target itself and only look at neutrons coming from the moderators, and then we will be looking at the moderated spectrum. So here you see the shielding, shielding which is uh, with a hole in the middle letting through the fast neutrons, or inversely, uh, just shielding in the middle, which will block the fast neutrons before neutrons fly into the different beam lines. Now, as I said before, since we are producing neutrons with this whole spectrum quite simultaneously all the time, uh, we have to determine the neutron energy at the moment uh, at which the neutron is interacting with the uh, material that we're interested in. And this is done by the time of flight technique. So how does it work? Well, we have the, the target moderator assembly where the neutrons are produced. And then at some distance L, we have a sample that we want to study and some detector that will detect the, neutri the neutron-induced reaction that we're interested in. Now, the pulsed electron beam will impinge on the, the target moderator assembly and produce a neutron beam. It will produce a neutron pulse because it's the pulsed electron beam, so it's very important that it's pulsed. Um, a neutron will be generated, will be created, and will start flying with certain speeds uh, to the sample. If it interacts with the sample, it might create some sort of uh, reaction product or reaction radiation, which is detected by the detector. So if we determine the time at which the electron pulse is leaving the accelerator and we determine the time 
at which the neutron is interacting with the sample, so basically the time at which we record an event in our detector. We have the time of flight, the, the time the neutron needed to fly from the target, the neutron producing target, to the sample that we wanted to study. And so the time of flight gives us the speed, because we know the, the distance it has traveled, we know the time it traveled, and if we have the speed of the neutron, we also have its energy. So that's how the time of flight technique works. Now, in practice, it's a little bit uh, more complicated than that, because uh, when the electron beam is hitting the target moderator assembly, as I said, in the moderator you want to slow down the neutrons. And so this is done by a number of collisions of the neutron with the material in the target moderator assembly. So the neutron already travels a certain distance and it also it's already traveling for a certain time within the target moderator assembly before it's leaving the target moderator assembly and flying towards the sample. So what we measure is the difference in time between the signal in the detector and electrons leaving the accelerator. <coughs> Most of the time there is also an offset involved because just simply by electronics or different cable lengths, especially if you're um, doing a measurement at 400 meter distance, well the signal coming from the detector will travel, will have to travel 400 meters uh, before you can uh, compare it with the signal coming from your accelerator, so that's something you have to take into account. This offset you can determine by uh, the gamma flash. Uh, the gamma flash is uh, a flash of gammas which is produced at the moment when your electron beam is hitting your uranium target. So as I said, when the uh, electrons are hitting uranium target, they are slowed down. You produce a lot of bremsstrahlung, of gamma strahlung, and this is basically instantaneous. It's a flash that's produced at the moment when the pulse, the electron pulse is hitting the target. And of course, um, you know that this is the moment where which also the neutrons were created. Uh, you know the time of flight of uh, gamma, of photons, it's the speed of light, so you can perfectly calibrate your, uh, your timing or determine the time offset by looking at the moment in which you detect your gamma flash in your detector. So that's, uh, that's that. Now, we're still dealing with the measured time of flight and not the real time of flight, because the real time of flight is the time that the neutron needs to go from here to here, but it's losing some time here, and it might also lose some time in the target or in the detector. So that's something we have to take into account. We have to take into account the time the neutron is traveling in the moderator or in the neutron producing target before it starts flying towards our sample. And also the neutron might be traveling around in your sample. That's something I think Carlos or Peter will discuss uh, later today or tomorrow, before the reaction product, before the reaction takes place and before the reaction product is entering in your detector. So that's also something that you have to take into account. So the real, the actual time of flight will be an expression like this. And this will give you the actual speed of the neutron and thus the neutron energy that you want to determine. Now, as I said, at Gilina, with the time of flight technique, we are mostly interested in the cross-section region where we are seeing very sharp peaks in the cross-section, so what we call resonances, so it's the, the resonance region. Now this is a, a theoretical shape of what you would expect for a typical resonance in uh, iron 56, I think, not 65. Peter? 56, 56 yeah. <laughs> we'll change that. Um, there are a number of differences between the th what you would e expect theoretically and what you will actually m measure. So one of the things that, uh, that interferes is what we call Doppler broadening. I will not go into too much detail, but I will discuss a bit uh, later on. It's a broadening effect due to the, the finite temperature of the sample that you're measuring. So it's related to the thermal motion of the atoms or the molecules in the sample material that you're uh, studying. On top of that, there's also uh, some experimental resolution in, involved. So something which is related to the limited, experimentally or physically limited resolution of your time of flight facility. Now, and in summary, you could say that the overall width of such a resonance will be determined by the, the resonance width, which is physics, 
by the experimental resolution, which is uh, yeah. detector physics or facility physics, and by the Doppler broadening, which is related to the, the temperature. And so typically, uh, you will get some shape like this, which is the result of all these different effects. Now, if you want to determine uh, the cross-sections accurately, and if you want to describe them accurately with nuclear theory and uh, make a consistent set of neutron data, you would like to get the parameters which correspond to the, the theory. So you would like to extract the, the total resonance width or the, the resonance parameters, the physical resonance parameters uh, for this specific reaction, for this specific uh, nucleus at this energy, and try to compensate or minimize or at least compensate for these effects. Now, <coughs> let me first discuss a bit the uh, experimental resolution uh, which is involved in time of flight measurements. So, as I said before, um, the, uh, the time, the actual time of flight that you would like to measure is a combination of a number of, number of, of uh, things. So it's a stop signal from your detector, start signal from your accelerator, there are some offsets, there is a time that your uh, neutron travels in the target moderator assembly, time that it might travel in the uh, sample and in the detector. Now, if you manage to do this, you can extract the speeds. And now, on the, this determination of the speed, there will be a number of uh, factors that are influencing the, the uncertainty on that. So, the relative uncertainty on your neutron speed is given by this expression. So, there's an expression or part of the expression depending on the uncertainty on the time and part of it depending on the uncertainty of the, uh, the distance. Now, how does this translate into an uncertainty on the neutron energy? It's actually quite simple. The relative uncertainty on the energy is given by this expression. And for non-relativistic energies, this is basically a factor of two. So this corresponds to the E is one half mv squared thing that we are all very familiar with. So if you want to look at the different uh, factors that have an influence on the energy resolution, actually we have to look at the different effects which have an influence on the time resolution and on the distance resolution in our time of flight measurements. Now if you look at the uncertainty on the actual the physical distance L between our target moderator assembly and uh, the sample that we want to study, that's something that nowadays we can measure quite accurately and I think it's fair to say that we can do that with an uncertainty of the order of one millimeter. But more importantly, there are a number of uh, effects that will influence the, the resolution, the time resolution of your time of flight measurement. And so each of these different terms that we have in the expression for time of flight will play a role. There is the uncertainty on the initial burst, how short is your electron pulse that you use to produce your neutrons. There is the uncertainty related to the time resolution of your detector and of the electronics that you use to treat your, your uh, um, signal coming from your detector. There is the uncertainty on the, the time that your neutron will pass in your target moderator system. And then there is uncertainty on the time that your neutron will spend in the, in the sample and possibly in the detector. Now, if we start with the uh, initial burst, that's... Uh, <coughs> something that's depending on the facility. For single burst machines, we mostly can assume uh, a Gaussian distribution in time. For Gelina, this is of the order of two nanoseconds full width half maximum. For Orela, which is a, a similar facility at Oak Ridge National Lab in the US, that's four nanoseconds. For Entov, it's of the order of eight nanoseconds. For some uh, facilities, um, the original electron pulse or the original pulse, neutron pulse, is not a single burst, but it's a double pulse structure. So this is the case for uh, ISIS in the UK and J-Park in Japan. And here you see a typical uh, time shape of the original initial burst for, for ISIS. So it's basically consisting of two bursts with uh, 300 nanoseconds spacing in between. So that's something that you have to take into account as a first step in your uh, uncertainty and your resolution. Um, the second thing is the time resolution of your detector and the electronics. Now, mostly, you can also suppose that this is uh, an uncertainty which follows a, a Gaussian distribution. 
it strongly depends on the detector type. So you have fast detector, detectors and slower detectors. Uh, a C6D6 liquid scintillator typically has a resolution below one nanoseconds. It's quite similar for a lithium glass scintillator. A fridge gridded ionization chamber, depending on the gas that you're using and uh, the size, the geometry of the chamber, but it usually has uh, a, an intrinsic uh, time resolution of the order of a few tenths of, of nanoseconds. And a germanium detector typically has a time resolution of 10 nanoseconds. Now, mostly the effects related to the initial burst and to the detector response are lumped together, are put together in one normal distribution with a specific full width half maximum. If we look at the next step, there's the neutron transport in your target and a moderator, and that's a bit more uh, complicated, that's less, less obvious. So if we um, look at uh, a distribution of a probability distribution of the time that your neutron will travel inside your moderator as a function of uh, neutron energy, you get something like this for Gelina. And so you see four groups. Each curve corresponds to a different <coughs> range in neutron energy. And so the faster neutrons in the 100 keV region, they are not moderated too much. So this means that they have not been traveling around in the moderator too long. So you see that the time they spent in the target moderator assembly is, is quite small. If you go to the other side of the spectrum, the, the thermal region, of course, you start with uh, neutrons in the MEV region, so they have to do a lot of collisions in the moderator before they slow down. And of course, also the slower they are, the more time they will spend, the longer they will need to fly before they leave the moderator. So you see that for the lower energy side, you get um, a distribution at, uh, at higher times. Now, this is a bit uh, not very practical to work with, since you see that it's there's a strong energy dependence in this probability function. Um, it's not so easy to find a, cons a consistent description for this. So what we do is we work with something which is called the equivalent distance. So we assume that we know the speed of the neutron and then we just uh, transform the time it needs or it spends in the moderator into a distance by uh, multiplying the time with the speed. You can do a mathematical transformation to transform this uh, distribution to a distribution as a function of equivalent distance, and then you end up with something like this. So then you get a number of curves, which are still depending on the neutron energy interval that you're looking at, but you see that they are much closer together, and it's also easier to interpolate in between these different curves to uh, cover the different neutron energy regions. So typically in the region between one and five electron volts, this uh, distribution in equivalent distance has uh, a width of two centimeters. Now, if we plot this figure on a logarithmic scale, uh, you see that the tail is also varying uh, according to the neutron energy region that we are looking at. Now, to get some feeling or some more feeling about how this distribution is Depending on the neutron energy, we have, made, or we have made some plots where we show here on one hand in green the most probable, uh, the most probable length. So it's the peak of the distribution for the different neutron energies. So you see that it's the most probable distance that a neutron travels or equivalent distance that a neutron travels in a moderator target assembly does not very strongly as a function of neutron energy. The most probable, that's the most probable one, the average one, so which is the, the weighted average of the whole distribution, you see that in a certain energy region, it's not so depending on neutron energies, but for higher neutron energies and for lower neutron energies, there is a, uh, a strong dependence on the neutron energy. Uh, also, if you look at the width of the distribution, so if you look at the full width half maximum, you see that it's quite flat uh, down to low energy neutrons, there the distribution gets much wider. Um, and if you look at the uh, 2.35 sigma, so which is the, the corresponding width for uh, a Gaussian, if you could fill it with a Gaussian, you see that it's also strongly differs from the full width half maximum. So it actually means that you have a very asymmetric shape of your uh, resolution function. And that this uh, asymmetry is becoming more important for thermal neutrons. 
Now, you can uh, calculate all these things, these resolution functions with Monte Carlo codes. There's also uh, a way to do it analytically. So to uh, split it up in different components. There is a neutron production component. So it's, as I said, it's um, uh, gamma N and gamma F reactions in the, in the uranium. So this part you can describe as an exponential decay. The neutron moderation process you can describe with a chi-square distribution and a storage term. So some of the neutrons might really travel around a long time into the, in the moderator, scattering around before they actually get out. There is something called the Cole and Windsor function, which is a, a theoretical approach or an analytical approach that's applied at a J Park in Japan. And something to take into account is that your resolution function uh, will also, or your yeah, your, dis, your, your resolution function or your uh, distribution will strongly depend on the neutron emission angle. Because if you're looking at a different angle with respect to the moderator, your neutrons will, on average, have to pass a longer or a shorter distance in the target moderator assembly. So that's also something that you have to take into account in this, into this uh, analytical expressions. Now this here shows you uh, a comparison between uh, a probability distribution obtained by Monte Carlo and by refit, which is uh, using an analytical expression but adjusted to experiment. And you see that both uh, succeed in describing the shape in a rather good way. I will not go too much into the details there. Now, if we look at the um, resolution, which is related to the, the photonuclear uh, part of the uh, neutron production process, and we try to compare this for different facilities, so we see that for Jelena and for Oak Ridge, it's an ENTOF. You see it uh, given here on the same picture. Uh, for Jelena, the delta L is of the order of 2 centimeters. For Aurela, it's also 2 centimeters. For Entov, it's 12 centimeters, which is not surprising, given the fact that the uh, target moderator assembly is, is, uh, has quite large uh, dimensions. If you look at some other spallation uh, sources like ISIS or JPARC, you see that depending on the facility and depending on uh, the process that you use to produce the neutrons, this resolution function might strongly vary. And this is another picture showing the resolution function as an uh, equivalent distance as a function of neutron energy, so for Jelina, for Antov, and for Lance, which is a time of flight facility at Los Alamos. Um, if you want to have some more information about the different uh, facilities, we have included some references in the presentation, so you can find some more details about that over there. A final component into this uh, equation that we showed before, which might contribute to the experimental resolution, is the neutron transport in the, in the detector. And as an example, I can show you the response function of a lithium glass detector. So a lithium glass detector is a detector which is used to detect uh, neutrons. Um, if you have a neutron beam which is impinging on the detector, and the detector is basically a slab, a square slab, uh, in this case uh, 1.6 millimeters, and a, thick, a thickness of a few millimeters, probably one point, uh, it's probably 16 centimeters. Um, and you look at the uh, contribution of the lithium glass uh, scintillator to your resolution, and you do the same thing. You also describe it as an equivalent distance. You get a distribution that looks more or less like this. And that's not so surprising, because if your neutron is impinging on your detector, it might impinge somewhere in the beginning of the detector, or it might uh, intrude into the detector a little bit deeper and only uh, interact with the detector a bit further down the road. So it's already normal that you get a distribution which corresponds to the, the physical width of your detector. What you also see here is that the interaction probability is decreasing, and that's not so surprising because that's a, so that's a self absorption effect. All the neutrons that are interacting in the beginning of the detector cannot uh, reach the end of the detector anymore. 
So actually what you see here is the neutron absorption, absorption along the thickness of the detector. And then there are some other effects which are, which are related to uh, neutron scattering in your detector before they are actually uh, producing a signal that you can detect. You also see a difference as a function of neutron energy. So here again, you will have to calculate this response function as a function of neutron energy in order to take it into account in the analysis of your data and to take it into account or to be able to extract the physical information from your, from your data. Um, to sum together or to bring together what we've seen before, so this is the expression we had before for delta V over V. Now what we can do is we can bring the L squared out of the square root and then you can write the same thing uh, in this way. Now if we bring everything together that we've discussed, so uh, uncertainty on the initial burst, detection system, neutron transport and target and detectors, which is described as an equivalent length, we get this expression where the different components related to these four points are uh, written down. Now, we are using in our analysis a program called REFIT, which is uh, including a numerical and, and analytical response functions and a combination of both in order to do a sort of deconvolution of the experimental effects uh, in the data. Now, it's important to realize that these different components will have different uh, importance depending on the flight path length and also depending on the neutron energy region that you are looking at. So if you just uh, assume um, uh, uncertainty of two centimeters on your flight path length, this will result in a, a flat uncertainty contribution, uh, which is apart from that neutron energy independent. The delta T will have uh, also an effect which is strongly varying with the neutron energy. And so if you combine both, you see that for lower neutron energies, actually the time dependent or the uncertainty on your time component becomes quite unimportant. There the resolution is mainly dominated by the uncertainty on your delta L. So on the um, <coughs> equivalent distance, traveling distance in your target, in your detector, or uh, intrinsically to the, of the facility. While for higher energies, the time resolution will be the decisive factor. So. I uh, know, but this, this delta L, the two centimeter, is the, it's also it's the um, equivalent distance, traveling distance, is the uncertainty on the equivalent traveling distance in the target's moderator assembly. So that's the, that's the delta L here. So. so that's also something that's intrinsic to your facility. So that's, that's always there. So just to illustrate that it doesn't make sense to worry too much about time resolution when you are in the electron volt region. And... It, Everything which is linked to uh, the uncertainty on the traveling distance is not so important anymore at, at high energy. So that's something that you have to take into account. Um, yeah, some slides seems to have escaped, but that's not so that's not, not so important. I said before that the difference between what you observe experimentally and the theoretical shape of um, of a resonance is uh, actually a combination of the theoretical shape of the experimental broadening and also of the Doppler broadening. And so, as I said before, the Doppler broadening is related to the thermal movement of uh, atoms, molecules in your sample uh, due to the, the finite temperature of a sample. So, uh, actually, the cross-section is depending on the energy of the neutron, but it's actually depending on the, the relative speed of the neutron and your sample nucleus. So if the sample nucleus has a certain thermal motion, the uh, relative speed between your impinging neutron and the target nucleus might vary depending on the direction in which the uh, atom <coughs> is, is vibrating. And so this effect will cause a broadening. This gives you a theoretical description. I will not go into the details of that. But this is a picture, a plot that shows you the effect of this. So at absolute zero temperature, zero Kelvin, a sharp peak or a resonance would look like that. At room temperature, by Doppler broadening, it's, also, it's already uh, broadened uh, down to this blue level. And if you go even to higher temperature, it gets broadened even more. And so this is not only uh, something which is interesting as uh, 
something to think about. It's also very important for reactor applications because they're often temperatures are reaching a few hundred degrees centigrades. And so the Doppler effect is something that's really influencing the way in which neutrons are interacting with the material in your reactor in, in real life. So if we come back to the theoretical capture yield, that's what you would expect theoretically. If you take into account the Doppler broadening, you get something like this. If you then include the uh, experimental resolution, for instance, at a, a 60 meter flight path, you see that there is some broadening, but it's quite limited because for a longer flight path, you have a, a better time of flight resolution. But if you go to shorter flight paths, you see that also the experimental effects become very important. So there is a, a big difference sometimes between what you see uh, experimentally and the uh, actual physical width that you would like to extract. Uh, here is another example to illustrate that. So it's a measurement, a capture measurement on gold at the 12 meter flight path. Uh, in this case at 12 meters, you see that the uh, experimental resolution is 2000 milli electron volts, so about two electron volts. The Doppler broadening is a little bit less than one electron volt and the actual physical width is 120 milli electron volts. So it's not straightforward to see the physical width in what you see experimentally. If you move to a longer flight path, and since the flight path length is uh, in the denominator of this uh, equation, uh, going to a longer flight path will increase or will improve the resolution. So if you go to a 30 meter flight path, you see that this already is drastically improving. So the Doppler, the broadening due to Doppler and the natural width stays the same but by reducing the experimental width, you already see that you get a much better separation of, of your peaks. Here, this works quite fine. If you look at the same reaction, but at a different neutron uh, energy, you see that here it doesn't help you a lot to go to a shorter flight path, because here your experimental resolution in, uh, improves from 200 milli electron volt to 80 milli electron volt, but since the Doppler broadening is causing a broadening of 300 milli electron volt, it doesn't really help a lot. So in, uh, in summary, I would like to say that the, the full width half maximum, so the resolution of what you measure is a combination of the total resonance with the Doppler broadening and the experimental resolution. And quite often, one of these two is, uh, is dominating what you see. So it's not straightforward to uh, extract the total width from the shape of your resonance. And in practice, it's quite often just the resonance area, which is the effective experimental observable that you get from your experiment. That's what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. We're not actually switching, so since we are a multi-user facility, on one flight path we look at the moderated, and on the other we look at the, the fast spectrum, and we are lose, using lead and uh, copper as a shielding material. So it's large blocks, I think it's about they're 25 centimeters thick, and it's normally enough to, to shield the neutrons that you're not interested in. If I think at the moment, one, two, well, not at the moment because the facility is down now, but one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think nine, nine at this, at this moment. So we are doing nine experiments at the same time. Even more if you can do an experiment in the same place. Yeah, okay. But now you're exaggerating, Carlos. Ah, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. More questions? And the frequency of 30 hertz? Ah, no, no. Uh, typically, that's sure. I didn't mention that. Typically, it's 800 hertz, so 800 pulses per second. But we can actually vary it, vary it down to yeah, as low as we want. But every now and then, we also do uh, 50 hertz measurements. Because I didn't mention it explicitly, but I think that Ralph mentioned it's this wraparound or this overlap. So you get overlap of 
neutrons from the previous burst into the next burst. Uh, you will discuss this, uh, then I'll... Bernard, say nothing. So which one did you? So it was something. It was uh, two slides, one effective pass, another um, uncertainty of this effective pass. Uh, yeah, this, this one. Yeah. So my question is, I can understand why it is uh, effective pass increasing when you go to the slow energy since you have a more interaction and so on. But why you have here increasing? Yeah, we were discussing this with each other yesterday, and we should ask our colleague. He's more. Inform, but I don't know, Peter, if you have anything uh, sensitive to say about this. It probably relates to a, a long tail change in the neutron count part in the uranium now. In the in, in, in the uranium cell so that uh, the set of uranium. Yeah, it's not so it looks, it looks a bit strange. I was also a bit surprised to, to see it. So you also see that if you look at the uh, original shape, you also see that for the fast neutrons, it has a very distinctive distinctive shape. So there has to be some effect that... Uh, you, also see, uh, you also see it here, that there is some special feature for the, the higher energy part. So we, we have to check with, maybe Stefan knows if we ask him. So th that's the advantage of being a, a multi-user facility. At some flight paths, which you really dedicate for this kind of experiments, you can just continue doing the experiment for a few months, and other people can do other experiments at the same time, which take uh, less time. But, but so we have a 400-meter flight path, but this is not used very frequently exactly because it would take an enormous amount of time to get sufficient uh, statistics there. They used to do it in the past. Apparently, in the past, people had more time than nowadays. But <laughs> 